Those who claim Pope Innocent III was the most qualified and effective Pope in the history of the Church, they would be right. For those that argue he was the most maniacal and violent, they too would be right. Innocent III sits comfortably on every theologian's list of top ten popes in history. Yet, unlike the others on the list, he will never be canonized and recognized for sainthood. There is no doubt that history involving Pope Innocent III has been revised and polished in retrospect by subsequent generations to save face on all sides. There is no doubt that Pope Innocent III, a central figure in 13th century church history, was a complicated character to understand and summarize. He called the Fourth and Fifth Crusade. He approved the formation of the Franciscans. He made the Inquisition famous, led the crusade that slaughtered the Albigensis, used the crusades to protect his own interest, called the fourth later in council to, quote, deliberate on the improvement of morals, the extinction of heresy, and the strengthening of the faith, end quote. In talking to Catholic Christians, they often use the nomenclature of 2,000 years, 2,000 years of church history, 2,000 years of this, 2,000 years of that. There couldn't be a more historically inaccurate statement. But what would be accurate is to say that the modern Catholic Church known today, at least through the 1950s, was started during the time of Pope Innocent, particularly by his fourth later in council in the early part of the 13th century. In relation to his role in the Fourth Crusade, good intentions eventually gave way to political scheming in high places and resulted in widespread misunderstanding, wanton disregard for Christian morality by some, greed by others, geopolitical interests commandeered legitimate crusade philosophy and turned it into the political weapon of the papacy. What one ultimately comes to conclude about the Fourth Crusade largely hinges on what one comes to believe about the motives and leadership of Pope Innocent III. There was no question that he had risen to power in the West intent on crusading. It was almost a given because the philosophy of the Crusades had permanently altered the way the Western Church approached God as an institution and as individuals. The church had become emotionally driven, idolatrous and cynical during the first three crusades, and under innocent would be pulled back towards strict legalism, which was not necessarily a bad thing because it provided more focus on core tenets of the faith. As for his leadership style and qualities, Pope Innocent was an entirely establishment pope. He was born into the De Conti family that had produced nine others, and through other family members had been around Roman pontifical administration his whole life, except when he was at school. He became the first pope to have a degree. In fact, he had two, one in theology and one in law. In fact, since De Conti returned to Rome in 1181 AD at the death of Pope Alexander III, he worked in various papal high offices during the short reigns of Lucius III, Urban III, Gregory VIII, Clement III, until finally attaining the rank of Cardinal Deacon in 1190 AD. The reign of his immediate predecessor ended with the sitting Pope Celestine III requesting his own successor. It was not Lotario de Conti, but a man named Giovanni de San Paolo that Celestine wanted. Instead of fulfilling his outgoing wish to raise San Paolo, however, 
the 37-year-old Lotario would ascend to the papacy as Pope Innocent III, voted in on the second ballot by the College of Cardinals, and on the exact same day that his predecessor died. As a master of canon law, he would influence that area of the Catholic faith more than most of his predecessors, if not all. However, he was also so heavily institutionalized and connected that he was well known to have used the interdict, prevention of certain rights and privileges, as his primary form of censure on royalty from whom he wanted obedience on an issue or situation. He made kings and princes all through Western Europe. He notoriously worked from behind the scenes to ensure things worked out exactly the way he wanted them to work. One can't help but consider the words of Abram Leon Sakar in regards to Pope Innocent III, though. On one hand, he called him the most able statesman in history up to that point, eloquent, well-versed in legal and theological learning. On the other hand, he did not shrink from bloody crusade to exterminate the evil of heresy and any enemy to his vision of the church. Sakar noted, It was natural for such a strong, imperious fanatic to be an enemy of the Jews. No one ever did them more harm. On one hand, like popes in his recent past, he had the Holy Roman Emperor intent on being in control of Western Europe. Although he also enjoyed a more stable, unchallenged, and respected papacy than recent predecessors. One wonders if the deaths of pontiffs in such rapid succession compelled the cardinals to desire such a young man for the job, or if his vast networks of contacts procured the position for him despite the usual practice of older men attaining the papacy. Pope Innocent III's call to take up the cross for a fourth crusade, which was to be a holy mission into Egypt to overthrow the Ayyubid dynasty, had been glimpsed for a fleeting moment during the Third Crusade. Richard the Lionheart had taken Ashkelon, realizing that it was a central point where men and arms had flowed from Egypt into Palestine. The leadership in Jerusalem discouraged the very capable Richard the Lionhearted from taking Jerusalem at that time, concerned about their ability to hold it once the Crusade ended. Instead, Richard had swung south to the area right outside of Ashkelon. It became the prevailing thinking in the West that whoever controlled North Africa, particularly Egypt, would occupy Jerusalem long term. The Pope was militant in his view about how a crusade should work. In fact, he viewed the Third Crusade as a failure, simply because Jerusalem was not recaptured as part of their gains. Never mind that Richard had abided by the advice of the men charged with protecting the region. He was largely alone because most viewed it as one of the most successful crusades. Perhaps it sheds insight as to Pope Innocent III's view on human life and its dispensability in pursuit of following canon law to perfection. Almost a half million would die by his pen alone. He knew possibly hundreds would die if a retaken Jerusalem did not have adequate numbers to secure it. Pope Innocent III rose to power at a time when there was peace in the Holy Land stemming from the Treaty of Ramla. One condition of the treaty was originally a three-year peace accord, signed the year before Innocent took office. As the 13th century dawned, Collaboration between crusading nation-states in Western Europe strengthened her economies, trade relations, raised the profile of civilized warfare, culture, technology, and Christian thought in general. The European monarchies at times were made constantly stronger by their own alliances and by the influence of Pope Innocent III. Thank you for listening and I look forward to talking to you next time when we lay the groundwork for the Fourth Crusade.
talk to you next time.